have motorcycle royalty visiting us today. He's the guiding force behind this bike. This is a modern interpretation of the famous uh, Yamaha TZ750 that was one of the dominating bikes of the late 70s and 80s. Let's meet three-time world champion Wayne Rainey. Wayne, come on in, buddy. Thanks for having me, Jay. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. So tell us what we have here. This is a modern version, a four-stroke version of that bike, correct? Yeah, it's, a, it's an R1 engine uh, uh, with um, current electronics, right. but a chassis that was built around it, and we wanted the look of it to look like the 1980s TZ750. Yeah. So that's what we got. And what does this weigh? This probably be around 350 pounds. That's a lot? I think it is. Real? Wow. But the bikes that I rode. Yeah, 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 I guess that's true. And what are we looking at, about 180 horse, something like yeah, that? Yeah, probably pushing 180 horsepower. Well, let's get your credits now. Three time, 500 cc world champion. What did you win in 87? I remember reading. AMA was... Superbike Championship. Okay, that's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, okay. here in the States. And you won Daytona? I won Daytona 200. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. And you had your accident in what, 93? 93. Okay. But you're still racing now. What are you racing, go-karts? Well, I was, you know, that's kind of what brought me to this. I was, um, after my accident, I started racing karts. I was a Yamaha ambassador. I helped uh, Laguna Seca get the MotoGP back in the U.S. Right, right. And so this is uh, what kind of led me to this. Now, now, let me ask you about family and friends when you go, I'm going to go racing again, go-karts. Do people kind of go, I mean, I love the spirit. I love the fact that you're committed to this, this is what you do, and, you, and you're a racer. You know, that's what's fun to me. I, I, don't, I, I never go anywhere near my limits, but you guys always take things all the time to the absolute limit. That's what I find amazing. Did people think you were crazy to start racing go-karts? Uh, I think my competitors were. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we built a 100 horsepower uh, TZ250 twin. Mm -hmm. And I could do the same lap times around Laguna Seca in that cart, what uh, AMA Superbikes were doing. Really? Yeah, so I had hand controls. Dan Gurney made me uh, special brakes that would work both the front and rear brake. Uh, he made me a special seat. My father made a roll cage. Eddie Lawson helped build the cart. And uh, when I got out there, I was, you know, I was in the car and going around the track, I was thinking, what do I have to do to find two tenths of a second? So right. putting that helmet back on was the you know, best thing for me. No, I, th I think that's great. And I love the fact that the whole community comes together, Eddie Lawson and Dan Gurney. And uh, I love Dan. He, wasn't he a wonderful man? Oh, yeah. Uh, he was a great guy. That was such a huge loss. And when I was a kid in the 60s, he was the guy. I remember car and driver ran a Dan Gurney for president campaign. Yeah. And I sent away and got the bumper stickers oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And he came here to the garage a couple of times and just to meet him. And he was also a builder, right? He built that alligator, right. that other right. bike. Was he the first American, maybe in a long time, to win with an American car of his own construction? That's I, right. Yeah, that's that right. Was, I believe it was that spa. <clears throat> I, I'm, it was in the early 60s. Right. But yeah, what a gentleman, and you know, he, he took a real interest in, in my situation and, and made it real comfortable for me to go out and race again and had a you know, real interest to make sure that what he was building for me was good so I could go out there and compete. So, yeah, yeah I miss him a lot. Now, tell us about Moto America. Now, you, <clears throat> you, you sort of helped bring Superbike racing back again, correct? Well, it kind of landed in my lap, that's yeah. for sure, Jay. So when we built this bike, it got me thinking back into the industry. So I reached back into the industry with uh, Olins and uh, Brembo brakes. Right. And uh, through those uh, contacts, we saw that the US championship was struggling. The last MotoGP world champion is a late Nikki Hayden. Right. And there was just no Americans coming through, so we decided to do something about that with Moto America. Oh, that's great. And this is one of the bikes leading the charge, isn't it? Yeah, this is what brought me and my, uh, my partners together, Richard Varner and Chuck Axlin and Terry Cargus. So we were able to start that championship because of this. So they're the guys that actually constructed the bike? Richard Pollock was the guy that constructed the bike. Okay. And I just like, I, I got all the jewelry for the bike. Right, All right. the cool bits. Yeah. yeah. Well, they are cool bits. I mean, it's, it's a great looking bike and it has that classic look of, of period. And what, what horsepower were they getting from that two stroke back in the day? You know, the two stroke that I rode was, uh, it was a four cylinder, uh, about 180 horsepower. Oh, was about the same. Yeah. yeah, but then, but on those bikes, the power band was only about 4,000 RPM. Right. So it didn't run below 8,000 RPM, and it signed off at about 12. Right. So, but you had about a 180, about 150 horsepower burst in that 4,000 RPM. Yeah. So yeah. 
that's uh, there's a lot of guys in my era limping around because of those bikes. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But there's nothing like a two-stroke. You know, I've got a 1929 Scott Squirrel over there, which was the water-cooled. I mean, it really is the predecessor to all these Japanese yeah. bikes. It's a water-cooled two-stroke. And the nice thing is, you just drop your foot, and it's you know. It's not one of these compression deals like kicking a Vela set where you're jumping up and down and thing. You just drop your leg and, boom, tick, 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 and it go. And I, I just love the power band and that, that burst of, of, of torque and speed when, when, you, when you hit about uh, whatever the RPM range yeah. is. In it. It's pretty neat. So who did you bring with us today? I see you brought a gentleman with you. I brought my partner Richard Varner with me today. He's the guy that was kind of pushing me to uh, Let's do this project, so. Yeah, well, he's been here before, Rich. Come on in. So yeah. how did you, uh, did you have to be convinced of this? Was this your idea? Uh, did he come to you and twist your arm? What happened? No, so what happened was uh, we'd been uh, building some older looking Triumphs that were kind of retro thing. Right, uh, right. And so, well, we had one here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the thought was, well, what can we do that's different? And the R1 idea came to us, and uh, we didn't know how to source all this stuff. And so I talked to Gordon McCall up in Monterey, and Gordon said, you got to talk to Wayne. Now he's the guy that does the quail, right? That's right. He yeah, does okay, the quail yeah. lodge and, and is prominent in, the, in our sport and what we do. So he introduced us to Wayne, and you know the engine's one thing, but I tell you what, you, we couldn't have done this without Wayne. And and we we partnered together and we started working together, and we started talking a lot about the old racing that mm -hmm. was going on and and the lack of racing and different things. And this bike bike brought us all together, and okay. and we we. Uh, talked on the phone all the time about it. I mean, even the forks, these forks are, you can't get them. Right. And, uh, but Wayne did. And they're specially constructed and, and the different bits and pieces. But Now but, this frame, is it a copy of the... the now there's some problems building this. The, the, the engine itself is much wider than the original TZ750. Right, sure. So we had, to, it's a bespoke frame. Richard Pollock at Mule Motorcycles built the frame around it and uh, shoehorned the motor in it. We did the, the fairing in our shop mostly. And then the electronics were another thing altogether. We had to bring some consultants in on. But, but uh, Wayne uh, helped us in, uh, in terms of the geometry and, and what the bike should, how it should be set up and right. that sort of thing. I'm looking at this thing and uh, obviously being a four stroke and it has some different, where's the battery? Where, where, where's it? The battery's in the seat. Under the seat. Yeah. Oh, in here? Okay. Yes. Yeah. What, a little lithium ion? It's a little lithium ion. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, that's pretty cool. The electronics, uh, we had to, we had to take the electronics apart to get the motor inside the chassis, but then we had to reorganize the electronics again, and that was the most difficult part. Yeah, that's the most difficult. That's, yeah. you know, modern stuff. You know, it's so funny. You can pull an engine or an old car from the 20s out, and gas, spark, air, boom, and it fires. All this electronic, I mean, you, you're, yeah. just, you're just screwed. It's, it's just so complicated. I, can't, I mean, it looks simple, but it's not, is it? This is extremely Yeah, it took a lot of time to build. Yeah. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I never got to ride the bike, but it looks like something I would really enjoy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is this something could ever be a street bike? Well, that was the original idea behind it was yeah. we thought we would build these and then maybe build 25 and see if there was a market for it. But then uh, the Moto America Superbike Championship got in the way, and so this is on the back burner at the moment. Yeah, we oh, we oh. spent our allowance on that. So oh, okay. It's... I mean, will you build some of these for that race? Not for that race, but we put this bike out on display. There's five classes in the Moto America Championship, mm -hmm. and the Superbike class is the main class. So, but we, we get bikes, the old style bikes out there on the track just for show for some of the fans. Right. So you, you'll see the bike once in a while out there on the track. And how many speed was your bike that you rode back in the day? Mine was a six speed. A six speed, okay. About 200 mile an hour. Okay, this is also six speed? Yes, it is. Okay, all right. Yeah, 200 mile an hour on a bike is, is moving. It's something to see. When they, when they do it in the rain, yeah. it's, it's even um, more unbelievable. Yeah, I was, I mean, at Circuit of America, I think I got it to about 160. And I said, well, this, this is kind of fast. <laughs> uh, and I was still 40 miles an hour down on that. I well, was it like, doesn't change much, really. Huh? When you're at 160 or 200, the only time you really feel you're going faster is when you jump off it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, know, I, luckily, you don't feel it, though, like if, if I'm going 160 or 200. Yeah. So well, close. just looking down and seeing 160, it was like, huh, hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, things happen quickly at 160. Tell me about the brakes. You know, Brembo, which is the, the Italian company that builds brakes for, right. you know, Ferrari, F1, Everybody. all the MotoGP bikes. They helped us with the brakes, and, and then Richard Pollock actually 
cut the disc out sure. of some special material. The forks, Jay, these are conventional forks because back in the 80s, the bikes didn't have upside down forks, which mm -hmm. is what they have now. Yeah. So Olin's made us a pair of conventional forks. Okay. But they're, they're, they, these are very rare. And you said the brakes are made with special material. What, what is the special material? Doing? Or is that like a secret? It depends how much money RV wants to spend. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all a matter of money, right? So, uh, I believe they're titanium, yeah. Titanium, okay. Well, that's kind of run a few bucks. It's, none of it's cheap. Yeah, yeah. But he cut them himself. But well, I imagine you saved quite a bit of weight with that. That's right, unsprung weight, yeah. Now, your bike back in the day was carbureted, correct? This is fuel injected. Fuel injected, oh, that's so right. You have, okay. How did you start those? Was it, was it? Well, when I first started racing Grand Prix in 1984, they had push start. So you would, everybody would qualify around, then you'd line up on the track, and everybody be in their starting position, and then it was just dead quiet. You would wait for the green light to come on, and then you'd be on the side of your bike, and you would push it two or three steps. You'd hit the tank with your chest, right. let the clutch out, and hopefully you'd, it was going right. to start. So like a Le Mans start like for a, a bike. Start. Yeah, right. yeah. Unfortunately, in, a, in the U.S., we don't have those style starts. So when I went over there to do that in 84, by the time I got my bike started, most of the time, Jake, I was behind the pace car. <laughs> so uh, that was normally the first guy I had to pass. So you couldn't, you couldn't have, like, other mechanics pushing you? You, you, no, you, you had to do it yourself? That was 84, but when okay. I went back and raced 500s, yeah. it was all running engine clutch starts because those push starts were just too dangerous. Yeah, yeah, just getting run over getting and run over. being exhausted or even falling down, you know, the bike yeah. hops and you... Somebody hits you as they go by. And what gear would you run and jump it in? Second? Third? Second gear. Oh, second yeah. gear, okay. Second of course, two-strokes are going to start a little easier because there's no compression, really. You just kind of... Well, you know, like in my case, the bike that I had, did, we, to make it run really good on the track, it didn't want to start well. Right. Because of the carbureted. So if we could get it to start good, it didn't go around the track right, very fast. it's too rich in that, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so it was always a balance there. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So tell me about the air box. I mean, you know, sometimes people look at something like this, oh, I took a piece of this, you put it in there, and you glue it. It's not. You have to, you have to make your own air box. You have to make your own air box, and, and that's always a challenge even on the race bikes because where do you carry the fuel? You want to carry it as low as you can. Right. Yeah, but how do you how do you put the air box with that and then uh, accommodate the fuel pump? Because the fuel pumps are critical on these. Right. They put up a lot of pressure for the fuel injection. So the tanks typically are the last things they make, and they make them over, but the air box is underneath, underneath the fuel tank, uh, and then it has a fairly large fuel pump on there as well. Well, I imagine also for the air box, it's got to be, well, I don't know if it's aerodynamic, but you, it's got to it's got to channel enough air That's right. so the thing's not choking. That's right. Oh, yeah. it, it's got to have a, a, enough velocity going through it to, to comes in mm -hmm. smoothly and, and uh, uh, has the best induction you can. You know, I learned that with steam cars. I got a couple old steam cars over there, these mm -hmm. double steam cars, and it's got to get a cert, just a certain amount of air. And we were, we'd be too small or too big, and, you know, it was really... Uh, it made me appreciate how much work is involved in doing that. So I imagine that's a lot of experimentation. It is. Okay. It is. You even know, even on the Grand Prix bikes, so that if you look at them, the gas tank is, will go all the way back in, uh, in front of the back wheel too. Right. And it's a it's a major undertaking to to build them correctly. We actually, uh, I had a MotoGP party at my house up there in Monterey, so we had this bike out in the garage, and so I brought out a bunch of the Yamaha engineers, and we had them peek at this, and we said, "What do you see the?" we should be looking at here and they go, you got to build a bigger air box for it. It's yeah. not big enough. So mm -hmm. that was one of the early. Oh, is that, and then you did that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's because people, it, it's got to flow, doesn't it? It's got to, because yeah, if it's, if it doesn't, if the air doesn't get into it fast enough, then it builds up and goes out around it. Right. And then if there's too much going in it, it chokes it. Right, right. It's just, wow. Yeah, it's a lot of science. Everything here is adjustable with shocks. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you, you had all this back in the day, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Olin's built all my stuff on my GP bikes, and, and they, uh, they built this for us. And the red line on this bike is 13,500, well, 14,000, really. Four strokes weren't turned to 14,000 back in your day, no. were they? No. That was... If they did, they, were, they didn't get <laughs> yeah, to the checkered flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah they go the way out. But two strokes were. Yeah. 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 Well, what, what kind of revs were you turning on those bikes? We could rev them to 12, and then they would over rev to 13. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. This would take one of the two strokes back in the day, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. with the electronics and the tire technology, but I think the challenge to ride the two-stroke, I think the current guys would, would have a big challenge doing that compared yeah. to what they currently ride. 
Because it must be funny talking to the new guys, because they probably never even been on a two-stroke, no. right? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. If you're like some old guy, just, well, back in my day, we didn't have well, I try not to do that, but uh, <laughs> they do ask me a lot, though. Boy, I'm sure glad we didn't have to ride those bikes that you did. Well, well that's pretty wild. All right, tires, anything special? What do you got here? Oh, these are Dunlops. Uh, okay. they're, they're DOT. These are DOT tires, but uh, we run Dunlops at, uh, in the Moto America series. Okay. Run slicks. That's one of the things Wayne's brought back is we wanted to make the Moto America series just like the International series. So we try to get the riders, you might talk about that, we to get the riders back on slicks as soon as we can. Oh, okay. Now before I take it for a ride, tell me, tell me about the race series you got going. We acquired the sanctioning rights for the U.S. Superbike Championship and rebranded it Moto America. We have a 10 race series that's raced in the U.S. It's on Fox Sports 2, the Superbike race is live this oh, year. Oh, cool. It's going to be on NBC Sports Network. And uh, we have a Moto America Live Plus video pass that um, you can watch from anywhere in the world. So this is the, it's the U.S. championship. Uh, it's very competitive. There's about five manufacturers involved in the Superbike class. And we want to see the um, American championship and the riders be competitive again. So we can get, if they want to go race in the world championship or if any rider wants to come race in the States, they can come race in the Moto America championship. And it's real exciting to watch now because you get the cameras down low on the bikes and you really see the guys leaning them over and, and there's a lot of passing. It's, it's sometimes Formula One gets a little kind of yeah. predictable. Whereas this, yeah. it, it, it's all over the place. and It's, it's, it's anything but predictable. Yeah, have, that's what's cool. Yeah, we got the onboard cameras, we got slow motion cameras, replays. You know, the guys are, they want that Moto America championship and, you know, they're willing to bump into each other and, yeah. you know, they're going 200 mile an hour. What's different nowadays, Jay's, because of the electronics is the riders now, they don't just drag their knees, they drag their elbows through the corners. Yeah, I mean, you're leaning. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like everything's on the ground. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm just dragging my ass. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's not real good. That's not real good. Well, cool. Well, I, I, I obviously am not a motorcycle racer, but I love bikes, and I'd love to just uh, take this for a little spin and see how it goes. Is that okay? Great. Can we yeah. do it? You bet. You bet. Ready? Yep. Okay. I mean, so you kind of realize that 200 miles an hour, that's real necessary. Obviously, around town, it could get a little twitchy, it might get a little grabby. So I'm just relying on the rear brakes for the most part. I wish I was good enough to make a bike like this do what it's capable of, but I'm not. So I will just enjoy it for the power band and the sheer... Uh, I guess what's the, the sheer perfection of it, I guess. But really, it's not too loud, and it's actually quite comfortable. I mean, for a race bike, this is pretty amazing. of motorcycles compared to cars is just unbelievable. I mean, this would be the equivalent of what? Uh, Enzo Ferrari, F1 McLaren, P1 McLaren. I mean, you've got 180 horsepower and you weigh under 400 pounds. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing.
obviously very impressive. What's really impressive are the brakes. Just the slightest, slightest touching of that front brake lever just gives you immediate stopping power. It's unbelievable. You know, Formula One drivers are amazing, but Superbike guys, I mean, to take this around corners to 200 miles an hour, where you're touching your elbows on the ground, oh my God! You know, you don't have to be a professional racer to understand the precision of a, a machine like this. Engine, brakes, suspension. As I said, I'm not capable of making this do anything, really. But I can appreciate it and understand it for what it's worth. This is the kind of machine you can have your whole life and you'd, you'd never be good enough to make it do what it's capable of. There's probably no more than a few dozen people in the world that can make a machine like this operate at its absolute limit. But we can try. I am not worthy. I mean, imagine the heat generated on that thing at 200 miles an hour when you just grab a fistful of front brake going into a corner. But you know, it's a lot more comfortable than I thought it would be. I thought I'd be breaking my back drive riding this thing, but it's not, it's, it's okay. I mean, I think this would make a great street bike. It's not that hot a day, but I think it's getting warm. I'm getting, my leg is getting covered in hot water here. So <laughs> we'll probably head back to the garage. I think once I'm moving, I get some air flowing through this thing. It'll cool down and that seems to be working fine now. I just can't sit for too long. After all, it is a race bike. Well, I want to thank Wayne Rainey and, and the guys for bringing this over. It's really exciting when you get to meet your heroes. Wayne is one of those guys that kind of, as I was coming up in my profession, he was kind of up in his. And to see him be three-time world champion and everything, it's pretty amazing. And he's still racing, though, even after his accident. So that shows you, you can't keep a good man down. Wayne, thank you so much. And uh, hey, check out this race series. I think you'll like it. I'm going to go faster to cool this thing off. Mm-hmm. <laughs>